I would like to start with the first talk. What could I say to the first topic? Maybe I try it li that way. Sometimes we as a community and the core team, we work on the smaller features. And sometimes we rewrite the user interface. And sometimes we are rewriting the content repository. Please welcome on stage Sebastian Kurfürst, Robert Lemke and Bernhard Schmidt. It's a Saturday, so we rewrite the content repository. Why not? Um, yeah, looks much better now. P PB paste, tile height syntax, PHP, what is that? <laughs> what node is that? Well, actually, um, <laughs> I have some, some command line which, uh, which makes syntax highlighting for slides, and I always put it in the first slide that I'm able to remember it, and <laughs> that is what you see That's currently. That's very expressive. <laughs> um, okay, so, yeah, hi, I'm Robert. Um, I'm... Uh, I was involved in the first content repository and I'm also involved in the second content repository. Um, Sebastian, do you, do you know Sebastian already? I think, yes, you've uh, heard about him. Yeah, he's also in the NEOS team uh, when he still went to school, like <laughs> some years ago. And Bernhard, um, is uh, the guy in charge uh, of the very complex parts of the content repository, which uh, I can't get my, my mind wrapped around. And he's also um, part of the NEAS team, of course. Oh, yeah, I have to click that button. That's what you meant with your face expression. So my task is only to get you uh, uh, very shortly into uh, what this is all about. So why are we... Uh, planning to or <laughs> actually doing a rewrite of the content repository. And as you hopefully know, the content repository is that part in NEOS which stores all the content. So we are not directly using uh, typical tables and fields in a database, but uh, we went some abstraction layer higher there and uh, used something called the content repository. That is something we discovered ages ago, and I didn't find better photos of that. Um, actually, we uh, uh, recorded a podcast, which could be on one of your file servers, Jürgen. Um, <laughs> Castor.something.de. I had a connection timeout. Anyway, there's a podcast, uh, and that guy in the second uh, picture, that is, that is David Nuschler. Today, he's vice president of enterprise technology at Adobe. And we discussed uh, how a content repository could look like for, uh, for Typo 3 back then, of course. Yeah, so we eventually became part of the JSR 283 standards uh, group and had some phone calls with them and so on. Um, but it turned out that um, the features we wanted to have eventually in NEOS didn't fit into the standard uh, or would would have taken too long for us to actually argue about, and you can imagine a standard is really difficult to evolve. So, I and we didn't have the resources and and the power for that. So, what we wanted was content dimensions, for example. Uh, what we wanted were uh, what we now have co node constraints, where we have uh, different rules which. Uh, tell about uh, what is allowed, which combinations are allowed in nodes, like you can only put a teaser into this collection, but not a whole shop plugin or something like that, and access control. So these are a few things we, we wanted to have. And of course, workspaces. Um, there is something like workspaces in the original standard, but uh, the workspaces which you now know in NEOS, which can be nested and uh, can be used for all kinds of crazy review scenarios that wouldn't have worked um, with the JSR standard. However, um, we discovered that there are a few limitations in the current content repository implementation. Um, of course, we tried back then, and that was how many years ago? I don't know, like just 
let's say 10 or something. <laughs> no, but it was at the very beginning, uh, way before the NEOS 1.0, of course, uh, that we um, designed the concept of the content repository. And we tried to, uh, we, we looked into all kinds of different theories like balanced B trees and whatnot and how to store content efficiently and, and make it efficient for read access. Um, but you can't really think something completely through until you gain more experience with it. So that also means that we need, needed to take a lot of uh, yeah, different ways after time and needed to change the code and so it became much more complex um, than in the start. In the start it was very easy, like node, create, hey, you have a node, set property and there you are. And then we discovered all the edge cases um, and we needed additional um, code for that. So that is a bit of what I also said in the keynote. The code becomes more complex. You could call it code rot because um, there's no one who could um, invest like a couple of weeks just to to um, improve um, the API. Or actually, we do that some, some from time to time. But also, of course, it needs to be backwards compatible. And even though we try to really optimize it uh, for read access and so on, we discovered that there are performance limitations, especially when you try to search. Um, that is why if you do some uh, real, uh, really difficult searching, you will always want to use Elasticsearch for that. But also <coughs> the right performance, which we didn't think was so important because I mean, when an editor creates a new page, um, we have all the time in the world to update something. But uh, we did not anticipate that we just want to import 200,000 products as nodes every night or something like that. And that turned out to be quite slow now. Yeah, and then that's kind of the, the black spot really is um, if you work with bigger teams with nested workspaces and then move around documents uh, and content and publish that. Um, there is really, I mean, you can imagine that this is a very complex scenario, which is um, comparable to other situations where you try to merge content. Um, but that is that turned out that it's very difficult to handle in, in the content repository. Yeah, and we have lots of more plans, of course. Uh, so who always uh, asks us about uh, re, uh, undo and redo. I think that there are a few people. <laughs> we wanted that from the beginning and thought like, yeah, we'll eventually find a way to do that. And well, that was, it, it would be possible, but it's, it's very difficult. And uh, the same goes for versioning. Um, also, it's very hard at the moment to trace um, uh, what someone did with your content. That is also something you, you stumble upon very often. You want to know, okay, how did that content end up on the website? Who did that? Um, and not, not only that publish um, um, publication step, but actually everything which, which led to it. And uh, that's quite difficult to do. So we thought using event sourcing for that could be a very cool idea. Um, who has a good idea about event sourcing? And I mean, for some it might become boring that we repeat it every year. We'll repeat it next year again. <laughs> um, because that is such an important topic for us. Um, so just in short words, explain what event sourcing is about. Usually when you want to store some content or s for example, someone put something in a shopping basket and you want to store that information, what you do is you write it directly into the database. And when, for example, the amount of that item changes in the shopping basket, you will update that information in the database. So you can always look into the database and see the most current uh, information. But what you can't see is uh, the historic information. So how it, how it came to be that, that information. Um, and with event sourcing, what you do is uh, you don't write to any database or so, but um, you are working with events. So you have events uh, like um, user or uh, a customer put an item, has put an item into the shopping basket, and then it has all the information about that. 
And then later on, you have a second event. Um, a customer increased the quantity of that item in the shopping basket. And you never throw away these events and you never change them again. You just store them line by line, everything which happened in the right order. So that means you have all the information um, about historic stuff and you can analyze your data in ways which you did not plan. So if one day you want to figure out why does someone, um, I mean, how many people put a pink elephant into the uh, shopping basket but never actually order it? Now you have all that information because you can replay all these events and then try to analyze how many people did that, right? So that is very roughly uh, what you can do with event sourcing. And event sourcing is uh, what we use for the new content repository and a technique called CQRS, which we talked about last year. And all the details uh, are told to by Sebastian and Bernhard. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> um, so let's again recap the basic idea of event sourcing and CQRS on a little more detailed level. If we look at the Node API, who knows the Node API and or work with it? That's some, right? I mean, the Node is the central data structure we store in NEOS in the content repository, and it's just a big tree of data, and the data items are called nodes. So we have this Node interface API, and what is done currently behind the scenes so um, is that we have some Node data repository. This then goes to uh, Doctrine, the object relational mapper of Doctrine, and in the end, things end up in the database. So you see it's quite a long way. And if we abstract a away a little, um, and actually in this Node Interface API, there are two parts uh, in there. One part, which is um, um, for, for reading, and the other part is for writing. Oops. So that means uh, the command part um, is for writing stuff um, to, the, to the database, and then there is a query part, which is for reading. So in a sense, we have a long way which just modifies state in the database. And um, the problem, of course, when you modify state, you, you, you're losing your old state. That is pretty much what Robert just uh, said. So, um, and by, by overriding this old state, you're losing that information. And that is something you can never restore, you can never get again, because it's just gone after this is rewritten. So let's check what happens when we try to approach that from an event source perspective. Again, we start with commands, um, which are um, like the starting point, which um, trigger modifications to state. We somehow convert them to events. I'll explain that in detail a little later. And then we store this in a so-called event store. And that's just essentially currently, a, or it's just a fancy name for an append-only log. So you can just take a single database table where you never delete from, which you never update. They just append entries one after another. And that is what it is. Uh, and yeah, as said, event store is just a totally fancy name for that. And then um, you're building up what's called projections. Um, and a projection is what you will use for reading things. And um, the good thing is that, um, so, so typically a projection has various database tables just as your old state basically was. But the good thing is you can actually have multiple of them um, without any drawbacks. So you can, um, you can create multiple of these projections. And um, if you, uh, like in, in, in classical modeling, basically people always say, you know, always model your data only once in the system and don't try to duplicate things. And then people came up with stuff like database normal forms and things like that. But the cool thing is, as we use the event store as the central tr uh, source of truth, um, we can replicate, we can duplicate information in whatever way we want in the different projections. There's no, no drawback anymore by doing that. So that means um, the, the code you created in the old style, this is basically moved to the projections and we are just putting some layers in, in front essentially, which um, are taking care with a different data path when mutating things. Just to finish the example, there's um, when converting from commands to events, you can actually read uh, the projections and by that you can implement something which is called a soft constraint. So you can actually um, check for certain assumptions which are valid. So for instance, if you create a node, you can check that the parent node actually exists and that's what we do. 
And just to finish, um, it's very important to think about there's a write side and a read side and they both complement each other and they are both extremely needed but we basically are tearing apart it apart a little more than we are doing currently and just in in, in a practical example when we look at it uh, how this is called from from the event store there we have one really really important um, um, uh, projection and that is the so-called uh, content graph um, that is something uh, Bernhard and Christopher have explained at the end of last year's conference that's basically how we it's it's a way how we store um, um, our nodes in a way which we can efficiently query in lots of cases um, so that's basically the replacement for the node data table in some way um, and um, the good thing is we can build up other projections so for instance there is another projection which uh, can let us know if a workspace is dirty or not and this is the projection we are using for the orange indicator on the top right of, of the NEOS UI which says you know you have five unpublished changes this will be read from, from, from that projection and the good thing is as said we can build arbitrarily many of them so let's just try to make it a little more concrete basically let's say we are starting to edit something um, so we are changing some I'm actually typing some words and what the UI then does it sends a command to the backend and then a command object is created which is called update please update this, these node properties and it says um, the old value was the one thing and the other one is is, is the new value and then we have some kind of identifiers um, which we need to know you know which node are we updating in which workspace we are and so on and if we take that command this is then dispatched to something called a command handler and the command handler does some checking it it just checks for instance does the parent exist does the node which we're actually changing is is really in the system for instance and when that all worked um, it is creating an event and if you if you if you compare the command and the event they are actually pretty much the same often but there's one important difference um the command is saying please update the node properties so it's still in the future it can fail for instance and the event says the node properties were updated so that means at the point where the event is in the event store it has happened so that's the point where we actually store information and an event is never modified never rewritten it just stays there conceptually forever so that means if we take this event stream in the event store um, there might be events like you know this node properties were updated then we create a new node um, we call that node aggregate with node but that's just a technical detail and then we we update properties of that node and then we can do something like creating a workspace basically and actually the last part is not fully true because um, we are we have changed the technical implementation behind workspaces quite a bit and um, this is um, what we are now calling a so-called content stream and um, I'm gonna explain that in a second so basically what we what we found out or what we discovered um, together with Matthias Veres I think two years one and a half years ago about that we had a workshop um, in, in Frankfurt where we met Matthias Veres, who is very, very good in helping people discover event sourcing and, and how to approach um, these kind of things. And um, what we figured out is that actually, uh, if you just uh, look at the live website, there's just a single event stream, as you can imagine, you know, which contains all the changes to the live website. But if you look at, uh, um, at your user's workspace, it's, it somehow feels like a branch in Git, right? I mean, we basically want to say, yeah, up to that point, we are in, in, the, in the live workspace, but then some further changes in the user workspace happen. So that means that the events E2 and E3 are the ones which happened only in the user workspace. And, you know, if, if nothing in between has happened um, on live, then we know that these events will also work on, on the live workspace, meaning that merging works. So that's just, if like in Git, if you merge something back, um, nothing has changed in, in the master branch. That's that's no no conflict at all. But if something on the live workspace has changed in the meantime, it can happen um, that there is a merge conflict, right? If the same node, for instance, has been modified or the node has been deleted, which we are trying to to modify, then there's a conflict in some way which we need to resolve. Um, and so 
what we say is this is what we try to detect or what we detect by just checking, oh, actually did something change on the live uh, workspace or not? And in case there might be a merge conflict, um, what we do is basically something like a rebase. So that means um, we, are, we are starting fresh again after the new, with a new event, with the E4 event, and then we are copying the events E2 and E3 um, again and just try to apply them. And if that works, um, then um, we are basically doing like a git rebase. We are taking some changes and we are putti putting them atop of the um, of the newly accumulated changes in the live workspace. Um, and there's one important property if you if you look at that, and this is um, if we um, if we um, did not um, so if I'm in my user workspace. Um, at the point where I'm writing um, this E3 event, which says set property or update node property, I'm not yet seeing um, this this event which happened on live. So actually, something has been published on the live website, but I'm a, I as the user workspace, I don't see this change yet. And this might seem strange at first, but just remember that for a second. Uh, we'll come back to that. But that's just an important uh, behavioral change um, compared to now. So that means um, we call all each of these paths so-called content stream. Um, and actually what we are doing is um, the, the workspace is just a pointer to the current content stream. So that means when we rebase, uh, we are just changing the pointer from the current content stream. And after the rebase, we'll just point it to, to the new content stream we've just created. So as said, changes to live workspaces are not immediately visible um, in the user workspace. And to, to think about it a little more clearly, um, we have to think about a little about, it, about consistency. And um, we are all striving for an immediately or strongly consistent system. That is something which is very desirable to have, right? Because we can very easily reason about it. We can have it in our minds very, very clearly. Uh, and we can just say, you know, no matter what we do, we'll always end up with a consistent state in our database. And that's very desirable to have. But it's also very hard to create. And uh, if you try to do it, um, there are certain inherent scaling limits which you cannot overcome just conceptually. On the other hand, what um, the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, is a not consistent system. That means it's a system which is, you know, which just it starts at some state which might hopefully be consistent and over time things degrade and get worse and worse and worse and at the end you end up with something which you don't uh, which you which you cannot make any sense of anymore so that's like the natural entropy of of the universe kicking in and then like things get worse and worse and worse basically um um and you end up in in neos you would end up with lots of orphan nodes which you cannot make any you know where you don't know oh well where was that actually what was the content in there no clue what it actually meant. So that's what we don't want to have. The interesting part is that between immediately consistent and not consistent, there is a really, really big gap, which is called eventually consistent. And eventually consistency means that we, we will be consistent at some point in the future, but there might be times in between where, where we are not fully consistent. So the important pa part about eventual consistency is that at some point in the future, we will have a consistent point uh, or a consistent view of the world, of in this case of our node tree again. And um, obviously, we are striving to ensure that this time frame where things are not consistent should be as short as possible. So that means, in a practical system, we probably think about that for a few seconds, uh, the change will not appear in the user's workspace because the rebase just takes a few seconds, for instance, and um, and um, a few seconds after it was published to the live website, it will appear in the user's workspace. And the nice thing is that these few seconds um, enable us quite a lot of imp performance improvements um, uh, in, in our system because we can then scale out work. We can easily say, okay, first we are taking care of live, then we, are, we might take a break if needed basically, and then we are updating the remaining things in the system. What is important when thinking about eventual consistency is that it's never, um, the user should not notice it basically. So that means from the viewpoint of one single user, it should always feel immediately consistent. I'm not saying it should be immediately consistent because that's just 
the full system as a whole. But I'm saying that, for instance, if I create a node in my workspace and then I switch to a different language, then I just expect this node to be there if the fallback nodes or uh, fallback rules are con correctly configured. It would not be acceptable if you change that and then the node is suddenly gone, for instance, and it just appears after a few seconds. And then I'm like, what? <laughs> but like if uh, two users actually see the change a little later, um, that's not a big deal usually because they don't sit next to each other screen by screen. And I'm like, oh, did you publish already? And, and you know, there's an inherent uh, gap between refreshing your browser uh, and so on and so on. And we are take, uh, thinking about asynchronous um, um, uh, and network connection anyway. So that means we are striving for an eventually consistent system, which still feels immediately consistent to every individual user. And this is actually a trick which enables us huge performance improvements and huge scaling improvements when working with lots of users, lots of concurrent edits and so on and so on. Right, and that's basically what, what we're aiming for, what like the, f the mindset we are having it. And um, you, we have been thinking about what to do about, like, should we show all the concepts in detail and, and, and you know, uh, a lot, uh, quite some things have happened since last conference where we last talked about it. But then we just said, well, maybe we'll just show it. Just we'll show our current state. And I'm really happy that um, Bernhard, who did a lot of work in the in the recent, uh, months um, actually will will demo what we currently have. So thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, in, when in doubt, uh, what to show when uh, dealing with uh, such large scale changes in the system? Um, where where do you start? So uh, basically, it's always the demo side. So what we did was disassemble the content of the node data repository, and um, rather guessed how this could have happened. Because all the information we need for an event store are gone, except the final outcome. Um, this is actually possible, and looks something like this. This is uh, our event store. You can uh, look at it and see the different things that happened. Um, content streams were created, workspaces were created, node aggregates and nodes were created, nodes were added, and so on. So this is what the event store looks like after this import. And there are 483, 63, somewhat, uh, something like that, um, events until the demo site is completely imported. And that's what it looks like, surprise. So this is actually projected into the content graph and works exactly the way it does it right now. So this isn't very interesting, actually. What is interesting is what happens if we don't import all those events, what happens if we, uh, s let's say, crop 300 of them? So same table, only 102 lines, and this is what comes out. So this is a, a, a rather drastically pruned tree with uh, some essential nodes missing. And um, so, so this is not undo. <laughs> this is, this never happened. There is no redo for this. But as you can see, you can replay the event stream until a certain point of time if you want and still get something that uh, works quite nicely. So if we go back one thing, uh, one slide. Um, all these events, when, when node properties first were set, for example, um, they work on a property level. So if two editors concurrently work on the same node, as long as they don't edit the same property, both changes are applied um, as opposed to right now in the old content repository. So how do we actually use this? Um, we had a rather large API with a node interface. Um, and there are basically two groups we were having a look at which use that node interface. One is the integrators. This is some snippet from the demo site, and um, it creates some content collections and um, it uses some content collections to render content. And yeah, that's the kind of fusion code you're used to. So this changes like not at all. There is one little restriction that we currently do not support absolute node paths yet. Um, we will do at some time. 
but there's one thing to be kept in mind. Um, path operations are actually a little bit more complex right now because the paths are no longer stored in the node data table. But there are actually really few cases where you need the path anymore. So for the uh, integrators, not much changes at all. Uh, for the developers, that's a different story. If you have a look at the old node interface, that one is rather cumbersome. There are 59 constants and methods uh, in total. Has any one of you tried to wrap something in the node interface that wasn't actually a node? Who has done that? How much fun was it? So you have to implement or declare a lot of uh, methods you never wanted to use, actually. But uh, these um, methods can be grouped into three parts. 24 of those methods are there for read access, another 24 are for active record style write and create methods, and 11 are for traversal. So let's see if we can split this up. So before it was the node interface that was responsible for everything. And now we have a node interface that is only there for property access. It is encapsulated into a traversable node interface which adds traversal capabilities. And uh, the commands are separated from this um, and are there for creation and mutation operations. So we don't actually mutate the objects we're dealing with, but we mutate the state in the database or wherever you project your content to. So how do we deal with those commands? Uh, commands require a lot of information uh, to specify exactly what the user wanted. Um, but so, so this is a little bit more complex than just uh, saying, hey, node at node, because the node currently lo knows a lot about the whole context thing. But this, uh, this contextual information will be readily available at other places for you. Then things that didn't make it. The content context will be gone. Will anyone miss it? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> so it's uh, basically replaced by the content subgraph, which can then be queried like in a very similar way than every other flow repository, except for a few m additional methods for traversal. The content context factory will somewhat be replaced by the content graph, which is basically the whole universe where you can get your content subgraphs from. The node data repository will be gone. Um, it has, uh, it, its functionality is also taken over by the content subgraph. And the linking service will be gone because you can link to nodes via the URI builder the same way you do it with uh, any other entity in Flow. And also the concept of shadow nodes is gone. It's that much gone that it's, it didn't even make it to the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so new features. We have bidirectional references. So we separated uh, references from properties because actually if you reference another node to one node, um, that doesn't make it a property. So the other not a node actually is not a property of the one node. Um, we do this uh, via reference relations between those two nodes and you can traverse between them in each direction. There will be a new flow query operations for this. So ca you can resolve those references in the one or the other direction. I don't no, there might be quite a few new installations no longer requiring Elasticsearch alone for this. We now have the ability to create lots of other projections like uh, search index, the workspace changes, so the, the dirty nodes that um, are displayed as the orange box in the top right, as Sebastian already told you, and this undo redo thing. So, so let's let's have a look at that. So, so you have your average Neos page. This is the homepage from the demo side, and you now change some properties. And what we did is we added another uh, projector, which 
uh, which saves snapshots of the nodes um, after those events. And uh, now let me take you down to the mythical underworld of the content repository. This is where all those past states of the nodes are kept and can come back to haunt you or make your life easier or something like that. Um, and what you can see here is, for one, that this was most probably copy-pasted from other templates by someone who is more interested in graph theory than user experience. And on the other hand, you see that um, you have the, uh, some kind of diff between the state back then and now. So you can go back to each of these versions, um, whatever fits your needs. So next part would be performance, and I hand this back over to Sebastian. Thank you. Right, so um, the important thing to remember, everything you've seen here is actual real code. There is no mockups involved in any way, but it's code which I'll show you in a bit where you can find that. Um, also, the, the, um, the undo-redo stuff was something which Bernhard implemented um, pretty much like Dimitri, like between yesterday evening and tomorrow morning, and today's morning. Well, actually, it was two days ago, I think. Um, it's not yet finished in any way, right? But it's just a proof of concept showing that it actually can be done really easily and really well implemented. Right, so let's talk about performance. I mean, you, know, you probably if you now have tried to follow you, there are quite some moving parts in your head and you're asking maybe, well, is that, isn't that all, all really slow what's happening there? And the thing to remember is that conceptually there are quite some pieces involved, but actually on the code level it's a lot easier than that. For instance, we don't have an object relational mapper. There's no doctrine ORM involved in any way. And um, if you've worked with flow and doctrine, this is some, somehow like a mess. It, it, it speeds you up very much with developing at first, but for certain use cases you shouldn't use it because it just makes, there's a certain boundary which you can only optimize for. So we'll just um, try to optimize things and there is a package called Plumber which we from time to time use for profile profiling and we, we put it out of our box. We, we put the dust out of it a little. It has been not updated for a long time so that was another reason again to do some things. Um, and then we started and we started, the important uh, uh, number is the number on the bottom right uh, next to the date which says 350 in the, in the first iteration. So at the end of February we were at 350 SQL queries for rendering a single page and of course that's too much obviously. Uh, and then successively we checked, you know, uh, wh which is the part which is currently the slowest and then we thought about, okay, how do we fix that? And as you can imagine, there are quite a few easy wins. So the next number is 172, just by really single caching optimization. And then there were other numbers which were harder to, to jump over basically because, um, you know, we had to think more about what we actually want and how to solve that. The important point is at the end, um, there are currently two numbers which are 6 and 53. And that's something which I'm gonna show a little more in detail now. So we are looking at, at uncached, an, an uncached website, by the way. So in the old uh, website, um, we had 150 queries and every, you see this line going up there, every po this, this line is comprised of many small points and every point is basically saying an SQL query. And you see, this is what happens like in the current version with Doctrine ORM, it just fires a lot of SQL queries just very evenly because, you know, it's, <laughs> and there's no way for us actually to influence that in any way, which is kind of hard. In the new, in the new um, um, version, we currently have about 50 um, SQL queries, and you see there are some jumps out of it, and, and uh, we can make d steeper um, essence, basically. And the main problem is, so, so the old queries, they get linearly more with the number of content you have on the website. So if you double the number of nodes on your page, then this number will go up twice. In the new one, actually, from this 50 queries, 25 queries are just because we haven't optimized the dimension menu yet. So it's very, very likely, or uh, it's just very easy to reduce that number even more. And this is a number which is pretty much constant, no matter how much content you have on your page. If you look at, um, th then you might think, well, we have this caching in place, right? That's correct. Um, the old caching, the old cached or the current cached version in NEOS actually has 46, uh, or only 10 queries. Uh, the new one has six, so that the difference is not that bad. But the important thing is, um, actually, 
by improving uncached performance, we are increasing the flexibility of NEOs quite tremendously because you can then, uh, you don't have to think about putting everything in the cache, but you can have larger parts of your site running in an uncached mode if you need that, if you should need that flexibility. And one particular nice example is menu rendering. <laughs> in the old version, we had one query per parent node. So for the huge um, 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 tree, there was a lot of queries. In the new one, there's one query, no matter how much we load. So it's just one single SQL query and that fetches everything we need. So that's quite nice. And I can show you the queries, by the way, not now, but if you like them, then uh, I can <laughs> I can uh, show you after the, the, the show, if you like. So, um, now we have some feature wishes which we'd like to do. Um, um, so we are we've already invested quite a bit in better read performance. Um, we will have something like inter more intelligent write conflict resolution, and actually we started with that already because that's on the property level as opposed to the node level. So that means one person can hide the node, the other can change the name, and this will just merge perfectly fine uh, without a conflict. And there are more ideas in that area. We by doing event sourcing and CQRS, we can synchronize content across instances a lot more easily because we actually don't just have the snapshot, but we just actually know, you know, uh, actually, you know, database creators are really intelligent by just creating this log <laughs> internally. <laughs> right, we can do versioning and undo redo um, as Bernard has just quickly demonstrated. And we could do stuff like editing notifications, like, you know, um, in, the, in the English version of the website, some content has been changed, which needs to be translated. So let's look at the current status. And just to be frank, um, it's obviously not finished at all. Um, on the contrary, it's still a lots, lots, lots of work. Everything you've seen is real code. It's running code. It's code you can check out and you can try out. Um, but still, there's a lot of things to do. Um, we are now currently releasing uh, technology preview one, um, which means you can play around with that please don't run your production systems on it yet in any way. <laughs> um, and, you know, currently um, what you can do is you can just clone the NEOS development distribution. There's a branch called event sourced in there and then you can compose an install and that basically gives you up and running and there's also a readme in there. And if you have questions, just um, there's a Slack channel uh, event sourcing which and content repository rewrite which um, uh, where we are there to help. So. What are the next steps? Well, <laughs> actually the to-do list is, is already quite long and there are p parts there like hiding nodes or deleting nodes or ensuring create node in the UI works. Um, you know, that's like, it's done conceptually and we know it, it, it will work for sure, but it just needs to be done and we have to do a lot of stabilization. And the problem is we just don't know all of these to-dos yet. We are still in this phase where like everything we do needs some something to be implemented. So that means when will it be finished? Well, to be frank, I don't know at all. Um, the point is uh, in the last uh, months, um, there were Robert and Bastian mostly working on some foundational stuff and Bernard and me on the CR stuff, which you've seen. But if we continue at that pace, we will be just, it will take very long. When the team grows, and that's what we hope for, and that's what we tried to start with at the uh, last at the code sprint a few days before, then maybe in a year from now, um, there will be a quite stable beta version. And Maybe we'll do fundraising. Um, as you might know, we've done this fundraising with the React UI um, half a year, a year ago. And I think that was a great success personally. We've been able to um, to finish the last 20% uh, um, and really get to a quite a well-functioning product. The problem is um, it's still quite hard to estimate what we actually need. So we, we cannot easily put a price tag on it. So we are we somehow need something like a first round of funding without actually, you know, where we just can push push it forward. And that's something we'll, we are currently thinking about. So if you have ideas or input about that, then please please talk to me and all the others involved. That would be really nice. So, right. I was thinking, what do I do about the summary of this talk? Well, just to say it quickly, it's the third rewrite. <laughs> and actually, if you look at the big parts in, in, in NEOS uh, and Flow, actually, everything has been pretty much rewritten the third time until it felt, well, uh, that was the point where it always felt well before and it was always like not really strange. So at least the statistics is on our side and I'm personally really happy and confident that we are on a great track. So yeah, thank you very much. And I'm not sure, I don't think, do we have time for one or two questions or not? Hmm.
Okay, one question. <laughs> then let's just put one or two and then we finish. Yeah, uh, thanks guys definitely for, for all the work you have done. What you did not mention um, is the possibilities that you are planning for the projections. So I guess there will be a, lot, a list of projections that come out of the box and there should be more that you can create for your certain project. Is there any kind of API or I'm even thinking about even building them with a fusion, fusion code style uh, if you can just say what you have planned for building your own project projections. I mean, um, yeah, so when, because it's all based on the event sourcing package, there's already the API you can use then. So you can subscribe to the interesting events and say, for example, I want uh, to put the latest five news of my uh, website into a JSON file, which I can directly deliver to some somewhere, something like that, because a projection cannot only be a database table or something, but can be anything you want to produce uh, in order to display it somewhere or move it somewhere. And so on that lower level, you already have the API, and I'm not sure, never thought about infusion, not sure. I see. But maybe we have some nice, nice yeah, mm -hmm. wrapping around it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely possible and, and very important feature of it, of course. All right, so if you have more questions, just come to us after the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>